When I uh, first started to teach writing, um, I commented on everything. Everything I saw, it got a comment. Um, and it turns out this is kind of common among new writing teachers, fledgling writing teachers. They tend to do that. But I might have attacked it with a bit more intensity than others because I just come out of an entirely different career and a different whole other career as a newspaper editor. Um, so you can feel sorry for my students, perhaps. Um, there are some, as you might imagine, some significant differences between the newsroom and the classroom. Um, in particular, uh, in the newsroom, the, prof the writers are professionals, so they may have occasional um, mechanical or grammatical errors, but they're incidental and not, they're not pattern problems that you need to teach. You don't need to pull them aside and teach them that comma splices. You just kind of fix it. Mostly the feedback that your reporters are going to be getting are um, in the form of questions. You're trying to ask them tough questions in order to tighten up the story and make it better. In the writing classroom with college freshmen, uh, this works out very differently. Um, in the college writing um, students, and actually writing students pretty much all through college and before college, um, have a tendency to say relatively little and use lots of words to do it. Um, and so there are fewer points of contact, contact for, making, for, for asking questions. Um, but they also make a lot of grammatical and mechanical errors along the way to saying not that much. Um, <laughs> um, so what happens is then is if you comment on everything, that same practice, comment on everything, um, the grammar feedback drowns out every other kind of feedback. It throws off their compass about what your expectations are as a teacher of writing in the class, whether you intend it or not. Uh, tends to become a grammar class. Now, outside of the writing classroom, um, in society in general, this seems okay in part because society tends to conflate these two things anyway. They tend to think of writing and grammar as basically the same thing. And I know this because whenever I introduce myself and I tell people what I do for a living, um, I say I, I'm, I'm a teacher of writing, I train teachers of writing, I run a college writing program, and they decide they need to watch they go the other direction, stop talking to me. Anyway, so, um, but the thing is, is that writing is a lot more than grammar. Grammar is a very, very small sliver of the writing pie. You're also coming up with ideas, you're organizing them, you're marshalling evidence in order to support those ideas. Um, and you're also like trying to anticipate the ways that your audience might react to what you're going to say um, and try to make it as effective as possible. All of these are part of the writing process and I think we, I'd hope we'd all, all agree that they all matter. Um, and the fact is that we have decades of data, um, of studies, of research showing that this emphasis on grammar may not be necessarily the best use of our time and energy. Um, and what I'd like to do today, um, it, because the ways that we teach writing in the classroom are often shaped more than you might realize by the way we talk about writing outside of the classroom, um, I'd like to share why I no longer teach the way I used to te teach writing and why most people who do what I do, who run writing programs, are, may occasionally express, occasionally express alarm or dismay at the direction of the conversation about writing and learning um, outside of the classroom. So in order to have this conversation, I'm going to need to share some benchmarks. We'll start with some benchmarks. Um, on the left-hand side of that graph, is uh, an effect size scale. Effect size is just a re education researcher's way of comparing results in one kind of educational study to results in another kind of an ed educational study. You can think of it as commonalizing the currency, right? Um, a zero effect size means the students didn't improve at all, right? Um, and so our first benchmark is second grade. In second grade, that's how much students improve in reading comprehension um, across a year of schooling. And um, I'm using reading because it's a national benchmark. We'll be getting to writing studies in, in a little bit on the next slide. Um, but I'm gonna be keeping that second and third grade impact there as a, as a uh, kind of a ruler or a benchmark for you to compare the other results to. But to put the second and gr third grade results in perspective themselves, um, that's fourth and fifth, that's ninth to 10th, that's 11th. Um, you can see that there's a diminishing returns as the students make their way through their educational programs. It gets harder and harder and harder to get significant impacts um, from the lessons you're giving them. And this particular trajectory occurs in reading, writing, math, anything you want to teach, that's the same kind of thing happens, the same basic pattern prevails. Um, so 
Keeping the second and third graders on the map, let's take a look at some writing studies. Specifically, let's look at what happens when education, education researchers take a whole bunch of studies on a particular subject and synthesize them and try to figure out what they say when they're put together. All right, there have been three of these kinds of studies. They're called meta-analyses. There have been three of those. Uh, 1986, 2007, 2012. I'm going to be going with the 1986 George Hillux data in part because later on I'm using um, one of the categories that he studied and the other two didn't. Um, so there are three really common kinds of approaches to teaching of writing. Um, one of them is to have students basically ignore grammar, stop thinking about grammar, instead have them try to generate ideas. They write as quickly and as fluidly as possible. Um, the whole idea, I, I like to say that um, people try to get them to the, what I call a page three idea. If you've ever written a paper or any document where you get to page three or page four or page five, you get an idea that you wish you'd had when you started, right? Okay, that's the whole idea behind free writing. It's to get you to that idea and then you can chuck everything because you weren't spending a lot of time trying to proofread it anyway. Right. So that comes in a little bit south of point two. Um, it's, it's a measurable impact. It's a, it is a, it, there is some improvement there. It, it's not a lot. Um, models, which is to have students look at examples of good writing and then try to imitate them, you study them. Um, that comes in a little bit higher, point two, two. And then there's the thing that everybody thinks that we should do and that administrators sometimes will chast start to chastise English teachers for not doing, um, particularly at the high school at secondary level, um, if they don't do these things, if they don't focus on the teaching grammar because grammar is measurable, and so it comes up a lot in tests, right? Um, trying to picture out where it's gonna go because I've already kind of hinted it's not good, right? So you may be picturing something like the 11th grade impact where it's like 0 .05, 0 .06, negative 0.29. Um, rounded off negative point three, and you might be thinking maybe I'm cherry picking, right? Because there were the, the other meta, st meta studies, right? The the 2007 2012 by Steve Graham, or meta analyses led by him. Um, no, in, in those meta studies, uh, it did worse. This is at the moment the best that grammar has performed on um, on a meta analytic uh, study, and it's not good, right? Um, and in fact, actually, it can get worse if you combine it. Um, with, say, negative feedback. Negative feedback, we know, um, we studied it in isolation, um, and it comes in also negative. And we know that if you combine it, because we have Adams' study from 1971 in which he did a grammar-focused class and also like only gave negative feedback, um, you can get something like a negative 0.51, where it looks like you're deleting second grade, right? Um, so, um, and I know, because I've given this talk a number of times, I, I'm, I'm kind of used to a question that pops up around now, which is how on earth do they get worse, right? How, because like, shouldn't you just stay still if you didn't get taught anything or you didn't improve? Well, so let's go back to what I was saying before about how, about how grammar is just a piece of the writing puzzle, right? Um, it's an unusual piece. It has a couple of qualities that are, are weird. Um, the first of them is that it almost always comes last or after the other things. You come up with an idea, then you express it, right? Um, the second unusual thing about it is it's the one that's the least deliberative and the most unconscious. You don't normally, in a state of nature, when you're not having an English teacher with a giant red pen leaning over your shoulder, you'd normally just express yourself without really thinking about every single word without trying to frame all the sentences. Frequently you head into the sentences without having any idea how you're gonna end them, right? And somehow it all turns out okay. Um, but if you try to th think about anything where you take it from an unconscious process, breathing, if you are good at like basketball, shooting baskets where it's become automated, think about any of those and what happens if you try to think about it consciously and deliberately, right? You start to fumble, you start to stum stumble. In speech or in writing, you get things like stuttering and stammering and blank pages and um, and writer's block and all kinds of other stuff. And if you put that at the front of the process, if you start emphasizing grammar so that people are thinking about what they're saying before they've fully figured out, when they're thinking about how to say what they're gonna say, how to articulate what they're thinking, um, and they haven't really fully formed the idea yet, then yeah, all kinds of things start to go wrong. Um, all the other cognitive balls in the basket get dropped. So. You might be wondering, okay, are there any methods that work? Because I just went over three of the big ones and like we had two you know, middling showings and then one like, let's avoid this one. Um, so yeah, there are. Um, there's, some good, there's some good methods, they're not used as often. Um, scales, for instance, you can train students on scales or rubrics and have them understand or teach them de deliberately the standards by which their writing might be evaluated. That can come in at a .36. 
um, or you can give them uh, a, a clear objective to work on, give them a team of allied students to work on it with, and provide them with some materials um, to work with while they do that. Um, say like research materials, so they're just trying to figure out how to analyze or interpret the research rather than having to dig it up from scratch. Um, in that kind of scaffolded environment, if it's aimed at writing, you can get something like a 0.44. Um, and then again, these kinds of effects can stack. Um, you can get something like Carol Sager's 1973 study where she used an environmental mode synergistically with scales and she gets a 0.93. And that's with sixth graders, so that's about more than twice the size that you nor of an effect that you would normally see for that grade level. It's extraordinary, really. And What's really interesting to me about the Sager study, the 1973 study, is that um, it's been kind of forgotten since then, but in the interim, in that space between, between then and now, uh, we've had a whole bunch of cognitive research, education research, that has identified principles of learning that when you apply them to the Sager study, when you look back at the Sager study, they explain why she was getting the results she was getting. And I'm gonna talk about two of those principles with the last stretch of my talk. The first of those principles is that we tend to write or do anything really to our own internalized standards. The standards we have up here are the ones that we tend to meet. Right. Kind of makes sense. Um, one of my favorite studies on this subject is from Kruger and Dunning um, in 1999. Um, if you've ever heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, that's where this comes from. And what they did was they gave their, uh, they gave their respondents, they gave a pull of survey respondents, um, a survey in which they asked them, like, how do you think you compare to the general public um, on grammar? Like, are you better, worse, whatever? You know, what percentile do you think you are? Rate yourself on grammar, rate yourself on logic, and rate your sense of humor while we're at it. Um, and then they tested them on all three of those. And now you're wondering how they tested the humor. Um, and I have no time in a TED Talk to get into that. Um, but I encourage you to Google it because what they did was kind of clever. Anyway, but they did test all three. And what they found consistently, and what has been found in other studies that have replicated this kind of an approach, is that there is this weird divide between what people think in terms of how they think they perform and how they actually perform. You have the bottom quartile, you have um, a basically a 50 percentage point gap between where they think they are and where they actually perform, right? And you wonder like, okay, how does that happen? Well, Kruger and Dunning think that their, their argument, and I think I find it persuasive, is that, um, is that competency and awareness of competency are mutually um, related, that they, that they influence each other deeply. Um, I like to use the word, uh, one word instead of competency and awareness, I use the word attunement. Um, and so you might look at it, this as saying, um, the people in that bottom quartile, they have their own internalized standards. And of course, they, as I said before, they meet their own internalized standards. Um, and so as far as they're concerned, they're doing okay. Right? Because they're meeting their own standards, they just aren't meeting anybody else's. Right? Um, and I guarantee you've seen this effect in action. Um, think American Idol tryouts. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> that one's a slow burner, right? Okay. So, um, okay. so the second principle is that uh, students benefit from what I call the teaching effect. And I, I guarantee you've had some experience with this at some point. At some point, you have tried to teach something to someone, and in doing so, you discovered that you learned it better than you'd learned it any other way before. Right. Um, that's a really common effect, and students are susceptible to it. Um, Noreen Webb did a series of studies, really clever studies in the early 1980s, um, in which she found that in a room full of students, or a group of students, if they're collaborating, it's the students who are explaining things who make these huge gains, and, um, and the students who, uh, who don't explain things um, don't actually do much of the learning in, in those environments. Um, and so that actually poses some interesting problems for this relationship because it means that I may be learning more about the subject than you are. Um, but, um, but I guarantee you've had some experience with this. Um, anyway, so going back to the Carol Sager study, what she did was kind of clever. She used the teaching effect in order to help students internalize the standards, specifically. She gave them a set of, of, of kinds of writing of a particular kind, and one of the kinds she had them practice was uh, description. This was the sixth graders. And so they would get a one through three scale, bad, middle, bad, middle, better, okay, for description. And then the students would sort the, uh, the descriptions into those stacks, into those piles, and determine whether they were a one or a two or a three. And then they would argue over, you know, you know, not just whether they'd placed them correctly, but like, okay, how would we bring the ones and the twos up to the three? And then they would revise the one and the two rating descriptions in order to improve them to that level. And then once they were done with all that, um, 
then you kind of close the deal by having them write their own. And they would repeat the process. They'd argue over how they thought they did. They'd, they'd discuss with their peers how they thought they did. And then they would come up with a revision plan and then they would revise. And the, re the effects are amazing. Right? Um, and I've seen this in, 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 in action. It's been replicated in other studies. Um, and it's phenomenal. And it is the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of really good research out there about ways to teach writing other than the ones I started off talking about. Um, and so then the question I'm always asked at this point uh, is, yeah, is essentially, why is it that this is th these other better methods aren't being used more often? Why are we doing the other things that don't seem to work? And there's part of the reason is that um, college English faculty fell violently out of love with um, empirical and statistical research in the mid to late 1980s. And so a lot of our English teachers today have taken English classes with people who either have never read this stuff or have forgotten about it in, or have kind of let it, that, that knowledge atrophy a bit. Meanwhile, most of the research that's been done in the interim um, on this subject and on the teaching of writing has been conducted in education, cog um, cognitive psychology, educational psychology, other fields. And we have a tendency in academia, unfortunately, to silo off our knowledge and to not really look at what other people in other disciplines are saying about what we're doing or about shared subject areas like writing. And so that's the why. Right? But the thing is, is it doesn't have to be that way. Right? The knowledge exists. They've done all the hard work. Right? We've got the data. We've done the experimental and control groups. We've done meta-analyses. Um, we've got all the information that's out there. And increasingly, it's coming out from behind paywalls. Um, the Sager study, the Hillock study, those are both. You can Google them. There, you can get them in PDF from the ERIC database, and you don't have to pay a dime to get them. Um, so increasingly, they're available. All we have to do is dig them up and use them. Thank you. Thank you.